Well, thank you very much indeed. And, and uh, can I begin by saying it's, uh, it's uh, an honour uh, to be here. And I was about to say, uh, in, I think, a pleasure, but uh, probably entirely my pleasure, I think, rather than uh, uh, anybody else's. Um, can I sort of say that immediately, I, I was, the, the title of the European Investigation Order and the uh, Public Prosecutor's Office uh, wasn't chosen um, by me, but I think it's uh, an, an excellent uh, title. Uh, because, as uh, you say, you know, the, these two proposals are going to be revolutionary if they actually do ever come to uh, fruition and are uh, adopted. Um, and I think in the shorter term, you're looking at the, uh, the European investigation order, I think, as creating uh, a revolution in the way that um, we deal with cross-border crime uh, in the uh, European Union. And that word revolution probably may, may sound a bit sort of hyperbol hyperbolic, but I think, in fact, in this case, it's actually justified because we're moving away from the traditional um, system of uh, mutual legal assistance to uh, mutual recognition. And this, this will be, I, th I think, uh, on, on adoption, uh, something which will change entirely. I'm, j I'm just sort of thinking of my own experience. Um, <clears throat> just by, by way of an example, under the old mutual legal assistance schemes, as you know, you start off with a prosecutor, perhaps, or a police officer or a judge, laboriously writing out uh, a, a request, a letter of uh, request. That request then has to be translated. It then has to go off on a sort of a long, dog-legged um, journey from one jurisdiction uh, to another. Perhaps you want to get hold of information about a bank account in Latvia or whatever it is. Uh, you send it. At at least in the UK system, you would send it first to, uh, once you'd had it translated into Latvian, you'd, trans you'd send it to your UK central authority in the Home Office. Uh, it would be there for an undetermined amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> it would then emerge from uh, the, uh, the Home Office. It would go over to uh, the recipient uh, jurisdiction. It would probably, depending upon their system, hit an another central authority. And if I, if I could sort of actually draw on my own experience in, in Spain, what, would, what usually happened was that the, the, uh, cent the central authority in Madrid would receive uh, the request for assistance. They would look at it and say, ah, you want to see, freeze a, a bank account in Barcelona, for example. Mm -hmm. So they would send it off to uh, some allocating court in Barcelona. In Barcelona, they would read it and they say, oh, no, it shouldn't come to us. This should have actually gone down to um, Tarragona or to Lerida or some, some other place. And so the, the, this, the system of actually tracing and getting the, the, uh, the, the letter of request uh, to the appropriate court was extremely time-consuming and very inefficient. And all that will change uh, with the, uh, the European investigation order if it actually comes on screen. Uh, so, and, and the revolutionary potential, I think, of the uh, EPPO is obvious to everybody as well. Just it's so controversial, mm. uh, as you've already mentioned. And the other thing which sort of struck me as, as being a, a good choice of uh, title, and as I say, not my, my choice at all, um, is that it, it, if you like sums up two perspectives on how you can actually construct an area of freedom, security and justice uh, in, in Europe. There are caricature approaches where you're a skeptic, you're a file, whatever one wants to call it, really. But there is, nevertheless, a distinct uh, difference of approach, I think, between those member states which take, um, if you like, still an intergovernmental approach uh, to um, judicial cooperation in Europe, and those who say the intergovernmental approach doesn't work or it has its limitations. We must move on to a supranational uh, approach. Um, and I think so far as the, the e EIO is concerned, in sort of very rough terms, you would sort of say that that's a cooperationist approach. Uh, the uh, EPPO, the Public Prosecutor's Office, is clearly an integrationist uh, uh, approach. And so the, this, this title, if you, look, if you like, sort of not only is the, it seizes on the two revolutionary proposals, but they are proposals which have a different perspective, a different uh, idea of what um, a European area of uh, freedom, security and justice uh, should be. And, and so Far, but all, all these things are blurred in reality. If you actually look at um, Eurojust itself, we are, we started, or we certainly started, I think, as an intergovernmental sort of organisation. But at, at the same time, within uh, Eurojust, there are, if you like, more supranational uh, elements as well. So at Eurojust, as you quite rightly say, we work as uh, a number of uh, national members from uh, individual member states, but we also work as a college 
And so you have, if you like, the two elements of uh, a member state approach, an intergovernmental approach, and a uh, um, supranational pro approaches at the same time. What, what I'm going to do is, is very brief, and I'm conscious of the, of the, of the time here, um, is to look at the, uh, the European investigation order, probably in slightly more detail than I will for the uh, European Public Prosecutor's Office. Uh, and that's not just because I'm trying to avoid uh, something which is extremely controversial, as you uh, say, uh, but I think in, in the, at least in the short to medium term, uh, the European investigation order has got uh, more importance to it, I think. So if you start with the European investigation order, start with the, its basic cooperationist uh, approach, you immediately, you immediately need to make qualifications, because although it does have this cooperationist bent to it, if you like, this, this basic approach, it's cooperation plus because it is uh, um, on the principle of uh, mutual recognition. And in, the, and in this case, I, I think it's fair to say that the, the difference, so far as the European investigation order is concerned, is not just that you have, if you like, the, the change from mutual legal assistance with the request system to an order system, with the, 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 something which uh, uh, a member state receiving an EIO has to um, uh, enact and execute, not just that basic difference of request and order, you also have something which is particularly important, I think, and that's a sort of a decentralising emphasis uh, so far as the European investigation order is, uh, is concerned. Uh, and I say it's a de decentralising <clears throat> because the whole idea behind the European investigation order is that a judge in, in Madrid will be able to uh, send an order for immediate execution to a judge in, uh, in, in London or, or wherever it is, or um, probably not in Dublin, as I understand, um, but, um, it, and, and, uh, and expect immediate execution uh, of, uh, of the order. And so in that sense, you're cutting out the, the central authority even more than they've been cut out already under the existing uh, MLA uh, approach. And so in that sense, you have, if you like, the, the member states' control over uh, mutual legal assistance being uh, diminished, I think, by the very fact that direct transmission replaces um, the, the, uh, the system of uh, central authority uh, transmission, which has been certainly the norm in, in common law um, uh, jurisdictions uh, until now. So that, 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 that's a, a fundamental change, it seems to me, not only from request to order, but also from, um, from central authority to control to a decentralisation, uh, I think, which is inherent in the system of, um, uh, of the uh, European investigation order. And allied to that you have, I think, um, and this is what people have written about as well, um, a change from, if you like, and it's, 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 a, it's another aspect perhaps of the same thing, of a national emphasis which is reflected in the traditional ways of mutual legal assistance to an emphasis on the individual. Because when the order actually comes before a court in one of the participating member states, um, when the, uh, if, if and when the European investigation order is, uh, is adopted, then in those circumstances the judge is only concerned with the individual case before him. That is his, his focus. Whereas if you do still have the MLA, traditional MLA approach, then you have a government um, department being involved and that's more likely to take, if you, if, if you will, some sort of national uh, approach. So that I think in, in the, this decentralising emphasis will be accompanied um, by a greater emphasis on the individual as opposed to to uh, uh, the, na the, the nation. And that, I think, is, is something which is inherent in the mutual recognition approach. There are other definite advantages, I think, um, certainly from the point of view of practitioners in this field, <coughs> uh, and that is that mutual recognition has written into it. Uh, um, it has the, the idea that there will be strict time limits. So I think in the, in the case of the EIO, at the moment, they're looking at something like three to four months for execution. At the moment, under MLA, you just don't know how long something is going to uh, take. I always remember, again, sort of from my own personal experience in, with Madrid, they briefed me about the Spanish, and they said, good heavens, mañana, um, you can send a request to Spain, and it will take a, a year for the Spanish to execute uh, that request. And I remember leaving the room in a state, state of shock, and then I just turned around and asked the person who had been briefing me, and how long, do the, how long does the U UK take, on average, to deal with a request? and they said 18 months, but there it is. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> they say here we don't have a word that expresses the same urgency as that. So anyway, that the, so, so far as the, the EIO is concerned, I think it, it will um, be a major uh, uh, step forward. Uh, and at the same time, it gives an opportunity, and that's what's been going on, I think, in Brussels at the moment, to take advantage of the past experience with mutual recognition instruments. Um, and the one glowing success which people always talk about, of course, is the, uh, uh, the European arrest warrant. Um, and on there, um, you can see in a way, the, the very success of the European arrest warrant throws up some problems as well, which the EIO, the European Investigation Order, uh, would have to address. Um, because the figures for the uh, European arrest warrant are quite surprising. I think, uh, well, I say surprise, they surprise me. Um, if you go back to 2004, when the European arrest warrant actually came into uh, force, um, I think there were only about 3,500 uh, European arrest warrants were actually issued throughout um, the European uh, Union. If you look at the latest available figures for uh, 2009, um, I think it is, you find that there are 14,000 uh, European arrest warrants issued uh, in the European Union. So there's been if you, something like a fourfold increase um, in that period, uh, in that five-year period, a major uh, success so far as the uh, use of the uh, EAW is concerned. And within that 14,000 issued uh, in 2009, there are huge discrepancies. I, I looked and saw that the, the figure so far as uh, Ireland was concerned, uh, the, the, you only issued 33 uh, European arrest warrants, I believe, in, in 2009. The UK only issued 220 uh, European arrest warrants in, in 2009. Other countries issued a great number of, uh, uh, by comparison, I think the Polish issued something in excess of four or 5,000 uh, European arrest warrants. And the obvious question is why has that, did, did that take place? Well, it depends upon their own legal system and in particular the adoption of the principle of legality as opposed to the principle of opportunity um, which exists in, uh, in our uh, common law uh, jurisdictions. Um, and I think the, the, because of that success, under the EIO, the European Investigation Order, they're worried about the number of um, requests, for example, for house searches, which will be issued um, throughout the, uh, the European uh, Union, I think, uh, and, and, and those recipient jurisdictions like, for example, uh, the UK, which received, I think, um, in the course of 2009, something in the region of 4,000 European arrest warrants. Um, they're, they're worried, well, if we receive the same sort of figures so far as European investigation orders uh, are concerned, we are going to have to devote a considerable uh, amount of uh, resources to ensure that those uh, investigations are, are met, that bank accounts are, are um, um, investigated, that we do actually break down people's doors um, and um, uh, uh, seize property uh, as, as requested by uh, various jurisdictions. So, so they're looking at ways to, if you like, limit the extent to which um, the European investigation order will bite. And they've come up with various um, particular, with various ways of doing this. The first way is to simply say that whenever a European investigation order is issued, there must be a regard to uh, necessity and uh, proportionality. And uh, Eurojust has had one, um, but it seems to be one minor but effective uh, suggestion so far as this is concerned. So that in the actual European investigation order form, uh, which the issuing prosecutor or judge has to sign, there will be, one hopes at least, a special little box which says, I have considered whether this is proportionate uh, to the offence. Uh, the, the history, unfortunately, in so far as the European arrest warrant is concerned, there have been cases, well publicised cases, where arrest warrants have been issued for the theft, I think, of a piglet. That was a particularly uh, uh, popular one so far as the press was, uh, was concerned. I, I think there was one allegedly issued for the, uh, the theft of a wardrobe door or, or something of, of this nature. So, so this kind of uh, thing is, is something which they, they don't want to have uh, repeated in the, uh, uh, under the European Investigation Order uh, um, procedure is, con uh, is uh, concerned. Uh, another way they're doing it is, is writing into the uh, European Investigation Order the possibility of saying that although you ask for a house search, it may be, which, which involves 
involves perhaps actually bang, banging down the door, um, it, the, you can choose a less intrusive uh, measure. And uh, it may well be that you don't actually need to get a warrant to search somebody's uh, house. It may be that simply asking somebody, will you let us look in uh, and, and walk around, that would be, be quite uh, sufficient. Wardrobe, yes, well, yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in those, uh, in, in those circumstances, use of a, of a less intrusive measure may well do uh, um, provide the benefit which the uh, European Investigation Order is uh, aimed to, at uh, providing. There are other sort of technical things which they've written as well. So um, there is uh, a provision in the European Investigation Order to um, give details of bank accounts. Um, and they've actually said, so far as that is concerned, that there must be a minimum threshold of offence being investigated. So the offence inve being investigated must carry a four-year uh, prison term, I think, as a minimum, maximum uh, uh, approach to uh, things. And there's also, but this is more, slightly more controversial because it goes against the idea of mutual recognition, um, there is the, uh, the idea, because of the Charter of Fundamental uh, Rights and Article 49, uh, which makes reference to uh, proportionality, that there may be a possibility for the executing judicial authority to say this is not proportionate, this is not in, um, in consonance with the um, Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights, and because of that, we are not going to uh, execute. That, I think, is, a, is, a, is a, a, a far more sensitive area, and it's unlikely that um, perhaps uh, people will go down that. Um, the, 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 the emphasis, really, is to encourage the issuing judicial authority uh, to look at the problems of proportionality rather than the executing judicial authority, because if not, you are going to be effectively abandoning, I think, uh, the principle of, um, uh, of mutual uh, recognition. So if, if proportionality is one important uh, area, uh, the, the one other important area, I think, is an, an, an drawing on past experience with mutual recognition instruments, that is the need for having one single instrument um, to... Um, uh, to, to, pr to provide um, investigators, prosecutors and, uh, and uh, defence counsel as well uh, with the ability of obtaining the evidence uh, which they need. And this has been, I think, a, a, uh, w why everybody expects the European evidence warrant uh, to be a failure. I, I, I have to put it in those, in those blunt terms. I did uh, check. Apparently, the European evidence warrant uh, should have come into force uh, in all member states on the 19th of January um, this year. Um, and um, I asked whether uh, there had been very many notifications as to this. Uh, and um, I think out of the 27, there was only one uh, member states which has actually uh, give, given some not notification. Uh, and, uh, and again, perhaps I shouldn't say surprising but it was, uh, it was Denmark, I think, on, on this occasion, the only uh, member state which has given it. But the, 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 the difficulty so far as the European evidence warrant is concerned and why people have said it's not going to be the way, the way forward is that it, it doesn't um, allow you to have a one-stop shop uh, so far as obtaining evidence uh, is, uh, is concerned. The European evidence warrant was very restricted in the sense that it said that you could only use it to obtain existing uh, uh, evidence. So under the European evidence warrant, you could not, for example, say, please go and take a statement uh, from the, uh, the witness in this uh, human trafficking case or this drug uh, trafficking case, because that was not an existing um, piece of, uh, of, of evidence. So you would have a situation where you would be issuing a European evidence warrant for perhaps an existing uh, piece of, uh, of evidence, a statement which had been taken, but then you would also have to issue a letter of request for uh, another witness statement which had not been taken. So that's fairly uh, a nonsensical. Uh, approach uh, was uh, considered to be uh, a failure uh, and because of that they, they've gone down the European investigation order approach which in itself uh, is aimed at providing cover for all investigative measures. Initially, there were lots of qualifications within the, uh, the draft order as to um, what should be actually uh, covered. And they had an exception for joint investigation teams, and in fact that, that exception still uh, is retained. But they also had an exception for any interception of, um, of uh, communication. So any telephone tapping would be out outside the scope of the European investigation order. 
That restriction has now been withdrawn. And so the, uh, the European investigation order in its current form, um, as I say, everything which we say is, is subject to uh, final uh, adoption and, uh, and approval. Uh, at the moment, the only exclusion so far as the European investigation order is concerned is, uh, so, and the investigative measures which are available is concerned with joint investigation teams. Um, I, I don't need to go to the net. Yeah. Uh, and that there's also, there is, that, that there's one other point which uh, Eurojust has specifically raised about the uh, limitation of the order, and that is that it doesn't actually deal with the freezing of assets. It, the, the order covers the freezing, if you like, the seizure of evidence, but it does not cover the, uh, the seizing of, uh, of assets. And so even though the, the, the theory and the thrust behind the order has been to provide a one, uh, co one, one way of covering all investigative and uh, evidential um, uh, targets, if you like, it hasn't, nevertheless, it hasn't been uh, a complete success because of these exceptions, but they're relatively minor exceptions, uh, I, I think. And the final thing I would say on before leaving the European investigation order is to, is to tie it in with something which, on the face of it, may not seem related, and that is the roadmap on procedural rights, um, which is now being, is now being implemented uh, by measures in, uh, in Brussels. And, and essentially, the, I think it's, it's probably the, the first measure which has actually been enacted um, uh, by Brussels has to do with the right to interpretation and, transla and uh, translation for for, uh, accused persons in criminal proceedings within the, uh, the European Union. And previously, that right to interpretation uh, simply uh, did not uh, exist. So you could have, uh, depending on the national jurisdiction that you were in, you could have a situation where uh, somebody could be uh, questioned and they weren't able, really, to understand uh, the questions which were uh, uh, put to them. Um, and I, I, I link those that, that, that the importance of that the the the, the roadmap on procedural uh, rights and, and and also one other very important directive which they're currently they're, um, discussing which is on the right to information so it means that any arrested person in the EU would actually be given a letter of rights which would actually set out in very simple and clear terms to what what they would be entitled to um, so far as um, uh, their, their their fundamental rights in the, in the proceedings were, were concerned I link these two, the European investigation order and procedural rights together, because the whole idea of, uh, of mutual recognition, which underlines uh, both the European arrest warrants and the European investigation order, is that you can trust people. And, and although, logically, you won't enact these measures unless you already trust people, in practice you need supplementary uh, measures because in the reality of it is that depending on the jurisdiction, some people will say, well, we're, 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 t we're, we're asking for evidence to be uh, obtained in a jurisdiction which perhaps hasn't had a very happy recent uh, history. Can we really be sure that the evidence which has ob been obtained has been obtained properly so far as admissibility for our purposes is, uh, is concerned? And so the, the fact that you have this thrust, the fairly recent thrust to uh, pushing uh, procedural rights for uh, defendants ties in, I think, with the, uh, uh, the importance of the European investigation order. Um, I'm sorry, have I, have I already overridden no, no, my time? No, 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 sorry, no, no, sorry, sorry. We have time for questions. Okay, yeah, you're right, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the, uh, the same, I, I, was, I, was, I was hoping, in fact, to have exhausted all the time so I wouldn't yeah. have to talk about the EPPO <laughs> again. Well, you can say it's a small word about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, perhaps I, could, I, I should say that the, um, uh, in, in sort of very, in very general terms, um, for, uh, the proposal uh, for a European Public Prosecutor's Office needs to be uh, seen in the sort of general context following the, uh, the Treaty of uh, Lisbon. Um, and I, I think so, certainly so far as Eurojust is concerned, because in, in Article 86 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, it says you may, um, if Member States so agree, uh, set up a European Public, Public Prosecutor's Office, and then it just says very briefly, inverted commas, from Eurojust. And it says no more than that. Uh, and so that gives a, a very large space for the possibility of, of, uh, uh, of exploring, exploring uh, options. And so far as we're concerned, I think at, uh, at Eurojust, it's important to bear in mind that we've had a, a new decision recently. And some people would say that um, what we need to do, and, and I say some people, ministers of justice <laughs> have said this effectively. Um, they have said that what they want to see is the, the new 
Eurojust uh, decision implemented fully in all member states, and the, the date for that is the 4th of June uh, this year, um, and see how that works. Um, you would then, and, and, and the, 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 the main provisions of, or the changes in this new decision are firstly that it uh, places an obligation uh, on member states to send information about their serious crime cases to uh, Eurojust. Um, and it also um, provides for national members at Eurojust, in, depending upon their national um, situation, having extended powers. Uh, so there's a strengthening of the, the, uh, the powers of national members at, uh, at uh, Eurojust. So member states have said, effectively, they want to see how this works in practice, uh, so far as um, the, uh, the, prevent, uh, the protection, for example, of financial interests of the European Union is concerned, which is what the European Public Prosecutor's Office is likely to be uh, about. See how it works at uh, Eurojust uh, before they move to the next step. And the next step is, in fact, not so much a European Public Prosecutor's Office from Eurojust. It's Article 85 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the, uh, the European Union, which talks about regulations for Eurojust. And the two important points, I think, about the new uh, regulation for Eurojust will be that it opens the possibility of having uh, Eurojust in, uh, it, it says, may give Eurojust the power to initiate uh, investigations. Uh, and some people would say that if Eurojust has in, uh, in The Hague or, uh, or, or, or possibly in, in another seat, has the power to initiate investigations, it already has the power to propose prosecutions uh, to member states, then what you will have is a European Public Prosecutor's Office de facto, although not um, in name. Mm. Um, so you would have a situation where there would be an initiation of investigation. Eurojust then makes a proposal to a member state that uh, there should be a prosecution as a result of that uh, investigation. And it's going to be extremely difficult, one would, would imagine, for a member state to turn around and sort of say, no, I'm sorry, in these circumstances, we're nevertheless not going to uh, proceed uh, with, the, um, uh, with, the, with the prosecution. And so some people sort of say that if you do have Article 85 in place, that is to say this initiation of in investigations, um, you won't necessarily need to go to the next step, uh, which is the, um, uh, the, the full-blooded uh, European Public Capacities of Office under Article uh, 86. And so far as the initiation of investigations is, is concerned, there are within that different schools of thought. Some people say that initiation of investigation means merely that Eurojust would be given a power um, to request a member state. Uh, or a group of member states to in, in undertake uh, an investigation. So it's a very, it would be a relatively low level power, not too dissimilar to, to be honest, to what we already have, um, to be able to uh, ask a member state to initiate an investigation. Uh, others say that there is a different level which could be emerge in the regulation, uh, and that is that Eurojust would be effectively in the position to require a member state to start an investigation. And the third and most important uh, approach would be, uh, or, or most developed, if you say, uh, um, approach would be to say that Eurojust could actually have its own body of uh, investigators who would be able to uh, uh, take forward a, a particular case uh, involving the financial interests of the, uh, the European Union. Um, and there's, there's obviously going to be a lot of argument, I think, over those. And, and at the moment, nobody quite knows when these proposals are going to um, emerge. I think in the uh, following the Stockholm programme, in the Stockholm Action Plan, uh, the Commission suggested that there would be a, uh, a proposal uh, for a uh, regulation on uh, Eurojust in 2012. The, uh, the, the sorts of uh, feedback one's getting at the moment suggests that that date may be moved into the, uh, the future. So far as the uh, creation of a European Public Prosecutor's Office is concerned, the Stockholm Action Plan was talking about 2013, uh, though they did say, as opposed to the proposal for a regulation under Article 85 for Eurojust, they did talk about what sounded slightly softer or, or uh, a communication 
about a European Public Prosecutor's Office in 2013. But I think both of these dates are likely to have uh, a considerable amount um, of, uh, of uh, slippage for them. Um, but what is clear, I think, from, from the, uh, the wording of Article 86 about the European Public Prosecutor's Office is that it will have, if it does come into effect, it will have a civil law approach. They're, they're, they, it won't have a common law approach. At least it won't have that division between investigation and prosecution, uh, which at least, it's certainly in the UK we, we associate with the, uh, the common law approach. It will have, because they, the treaty actually says that, investigate, prosecute and bring to justice. Uh, which is uh, going to be the role of the, uh, the European Public Prosecutor's uh, uh, Office. Um, and, and I think one real problem, uh, so far as the, the, uh, uh, the development of this is concerned, and what is the Commission now is trying to remedy, is actually to bring together hard, concrete information, uh, statistical information, about the extent of the problem. <coughs> Um, because if it's going to be, if the, you are going to have um, a, a power for Eurojust to investigate, have its own body of investigators, perhaps drawn from OLAF, you know, from the office of yeah. the anti-fraud office and so on, um, or, or use resources at Europol uh, as well for this kind of investigation of fraud, uh, and or move on to the full-blown European Public Prosecutor's Office, um, then you actually need to know what is the extent of the problem before you start investi um, investing resources, I think, to, to that extent. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed, Alan. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you.